three, two, one. In any real city you walk, you brush past people and people bump into you. In LA, nobody touches you. We're always behind this metal and glass. I think we miss that touch so much that we crash into each other just so we can feel something. That was a quote from the Boss Baby 2. This time it's Ugh. personal. Um, I'm Adam from Your Movie Sex. This is Sardonicast. Hello. I'm uh, Alex from I Hate Everything, and thanks for reminding me of that quote. Thanks for reminding me of that movie. It opened. I well, guess it's my <laughs> fault that we have to talk about it. But... Thanks for reminding you of the movie you recommended for this episode. <laughs> yeah, I just, I just oof. here's my favorite quote from the movie. Um, oh, r- racism is bad. <laughs> That's my quote. <laughs> it's a good quote. Remember that? <laughs> yeah. I remember when they looked at the camera and said that <laughs> every character at the same time. <laughs> that was one of the millions of millions of characters. Damn. That would have saved it. That would have saved it. Just a dozen you, people looking into the camera at the same time saying, racism is bad. <laughs> like all in unison. <laughs> I think that would have saved the movie. That's um, basically what it was. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Good movie. So before we get too distracted on that, um yeah sorry stay focused we watched another film also oh also fucking happy uh 25th of december everybody which is when this episode's public i guess and happy before that for our patrons and uh uh members happy holidays of whatever the fuck you probably think about them happy 25th yeah we kind of goofed it up because happy day I was anticipating like, oh, yeah, I'll recommend a a Christmas movie for the Christmas episode. And then I was like, oh, shit, I guess I guess my recommendation is on Christmas. And then the episode's coming out two weeks after that. Yeah, it's vaguely festive. We can leave it at that. Yes. And yeah, I actually have the Christmas wreck. And it it kind of worked out a little bit, (laughs) sort of, unintentionally. But (laughs) we can get into that crash later. Yeah, yeah. (laughs) Uh, When Evil Lurks is a film that uh, mm. apparently we could have saw at TIFF, but we missed because I, th- I guess we didn't know about it. I think when I was looking through uh, the list of films, I think the fact that it was a premiere and it didn't like have any, um, you know, it didn't have any like reception or award wins or anything from anything it doesn't have any big names attached either no. like i don't i'm not familiar with this director or writer or I, any of the actors in it his previous film terrified is in my watch list but it doesn't have like great ratings and there's like from what i've heard about it it's really mixed like some people hate it and i was like okay it's still in my watch right. list so there was some sort of like oh this is a movie that might be notable but you know to make room for other things i didn't i think i was going to actually look at when exactly it was playing and see what fucking movies we would have had to have missed because we we saw a lot of great movies at the festival so uh i don't Mm -hmm. know what we would have cut out to see this true certainly certainly wouldn't have wanted to miss aggro drift no no not again please why not (laughs) (laughs) when's the 4k blu-ray when's the more drift all right. No, uh, that would be on VHS only. It's the only way to watch it. Yeah, my, I mean that would that would sell. They they do a lot of uh there's a lot of like special VHS releases now. Skinamarink got one. Um A24 released oh, really? a VHS for Climax and they only released like fucking 100 copies, so they were all gone before I knew about it and I'm pissed. But whatever. Oh wow, yeah. It was like in the music space, just like tapes are kind of trendy. That's a weird in one. Certain spaces now and coming back. I don't know how I feel about that. I, I get records, but I don't yeah. know about tapes. I got bad memories associated with tapes, man. Vinyls have always made sense because it's the best and most physical, like highest quality sounding way you can listen to your music. Really, yeah. Like there's a. That there's a practical purpose to it. You get nice little, like album covers that are like big pictures you can hang up even if you want. You know, like we just had to make do with tapes. We didn't know better. Yeah, at that point, but we know better now. 
So going back just seems antithetical, antithetical to me. So I guess that's the point. Um, this is a film from Argentina. Mm. I think. Yeah, there we go. Argentina. And that's it. Everybody, have a good night. <laughs> that's our review. I thought you were I, the movie. Well, now that I don't know how to re- make reviews now that people are calling out plagiarism. I just read other people's reviews before. Mm, I don't know what to this say. Is really open. Wait, maybe I can just read the Wikipedia. <laughs> Like, <laughs> <laughs> is it fucking crazy how many people are just outed for just like, like what are the fu- you're what's the point of making videos? You're just reading like even if you even if what you're reading is just the plot synopsis, it's like okay, well you're kind of just exposing how much of your video is just reciting the plot and then saying I liked it. Fuck off! Everybody's pissing me off. This has always been like overt with channels like uh, you know those top ten channels and whatnot, like Watch Mojo and stuff like that. They feel like you know just a, a list website being read off, but there's more of like an abstraction when it's these personality-led channels and reviewers who are claiming to be giving their own opinions, and then it it turns out to be like not even a very well hidden. <laughs> almost yeah. word for word in some cases straight up word for word retelling of other people's work and it's like you could you could just reference it you could you could just straight up say in the video hey i, I like this imp- this interpretation from this source or whatever yeah why not part of the it's like what, uh, but then it's not yeah, it's, it's very not weird. then i mean the people doing it it's like it's not just a small portion it's like they're just lifting the entire thing and so they want to hide the fact that they're doing that because otherwise it just makes it seem like they didn't do anything, which is why they're able to pump out content so frequently. Well, yeah, hopefully it just gets more people talking about the uh, almost like sweatshop nature of a lot of channels that a lot of people don't even the think content about. The grind, yeah. They're like they're teams of people just like these like writers being underpaid to <laughs> put these videos together yeah. and just make them as quickly as possible where there's someone at the top kind of sucking up all the all the real earnings from it i couldn't imagine not writing my own shit like what's the fucking point of the channel what's the point like if what i thought what i'm selling is my perspective like outsourcing the editing sure like if you can do it in a way where like where i like it then great you know let's outsource some of the editing so i'm not hurting myself as much yeah that's really shifted now though like i don't know about how when you get emails from various companies and whatnot but i'm usually addressed by like the IHE team, mm-hmm. or yeah, whatever, yeah. it's never normally assumed. It's an individual. It's <laughs> normally true. assumed at this point that there's a team, um, and it's kind of there's something kind of saddening about that because it is like, yeah, everyone's kind of realized they can dial man their way to the top, you know, true. just make a content machine, a farm out of all this. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. I'm I'm actually kind of pissed about it because like part of the reason why I overwork myself is like comparison to other channels and being like wow they just pump out a lot of shit like what am i doing i'm I'm like trying to compete yeah in this not compete as in like dominate them or anything but you know like have have you know make a decent amount of money or something or make stay in the algorithm and not like just Mm -hmm. get drowned out by other people well yeah well comparison is a killer of joy um, yeah, and it's like it's really unsustainable. If you want to, you could do that. If you wanted to have like a full team of uh, people grinding out content for you, it's all about weighing that up. But I don't know. I don't like it. I'm old man yells at cloud about this. I guess. Yeah, at the Google Cloud. Oh God, it's, we can't escape old it. Old man yells at storage, <laughs> oh cloud storage. Uh, when evil lurks. I was very pleasantly surprised by this movie. I don't know how you felt about it. I was, I was surprised in the right too. Mood. I was in the right mood and I was experiencing the right emotions. Uh, this is a very like kind of nightmare logic movie in a way. I think that it hits mm-hmm. what it, it it is perfect for what it is going for in the sense that there's a lot of movies where I get confused and I get pissed off because of me being confused. This is one where I'm like, okay, I'm confused, but it works. And the the characters are mm-hmm. confused too, and you know I I was feeling vibes of like it comes at night, and the Last of Us TV show. A lot of the music uh, was you know similar enough it, without it feeling mm. like a ripoff or anything, um, but like some of the energy hereditary. I felt um, yeah. I was getting some Silent Hill vibes 
as well. Resident Evil a little bit. Honestly, I would love to see this director, you know, tackle an IP or something. But yeah, well, it's probably the most the best way for them to get a, another job in the space. Yeah, like a Disney will probably just swoop them up and <laughs> get them to do some comatose project. But uh, yeah, I was right there with you. Uh, I I liked the I don't want to call it a bottle movie, but it's more like the whole town is like a bottle. Yeah, um, it felt very kind of contained and claustrophobic and. I like the kind of world building horror elements like that's always such a game with these these horror properties in particular it's like how much are you going to explain how much are you going to revel in like the lore of this and are you going to go full like the ring and try and explain it this to like to the very end are you going to keep elements of this more of a mystery like something like the mist and yeah leave that kind of existential horror alive and having that that the crux being this idea of the a rotten, they call it, or whatever. Mm. It's like an unborn demon possessing someone, and they're presented as this like swollen. It looks like a body that's been in water for like weeks. And looks like a boomer. And all this. Like it does look like a boomer from Left 4 <laughs> Dead. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It looks like someone born in the sixties. Yeah, um, looks like our a parents. Brexit geezer. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. I thought it was like just restrained enough though. You get it plays with the concepts of because again, like possession movies are not exactly a new thing in the horror space and they can so, some of the best horror and worst horror are both like possession slash ghost yeah. slash demon i don't even know how to type movies categorize this <laughs> like i don't know if i i don't even when i think possession movie i don't even like this doesn't even feel like one even though it's like yeah i guess there's possession in it it's it's a very um it feels both simultaneously contained and small scale but also large scale like and ambitious at the same time it's it's so weird how it it manages to feel like these i guess almost contradictory ways simultaneously yeah um and it's doing a bunch of different genres at once too like kind of zombie kind of ghosts kind of you know like uh apocalyptic like end of the world-ish kind of you know yeah. like I was getting vibes of like Southbound at one point in time, which is just literally an anthology mm -hmm. horror film that um, producers of uh, the VHS franchise did that I enjoyed. It's not incredible, but yeah. Yeah, yeah. I was thinking of VHS a little bit. Yeah. I like this probably more than any of those VHS shorts, though. It's way more cohesive yeah. as a single story. And despite everything being so, <laughs> I guess, kind of it's seemingly random or made up or, or like, you know, just the film decides whatever rules apply at any given moment in time, I guess. It's interesting because there are certain characters in the film that seem to have like a clear idea <laughs> of what these rules are. And that, you know, there's other characters that just need those things explained to them. Like, no, don't shoot. You have to kill it with an axe. Otherwise, we'll be uh, <laughs> like possessed or something. Like, I don't. It's confusing as fuck. But I, I think that that adds to the horror nature of it. Um, it feels way less manipulative than something like, uh, what's that fucking movie called? The Qu A Quiet Place, where that movie, oh that movie has more consistent rules, but in any given scene, the goal of the scene is just like, oh, how do we make these characters in a situation where it's going to be tough for them to be quiet and they got to be quiet, otherwise they're going to get killed. You know, and it's just like the most repetitive, manipulative, like no characters are characters, they're all just props, right? Um, mm -hmm. Whereas this, it's like, okay, this makes a lot less sense, but I believe the characters more. I feel respected more by the script and the sequence of events and how things happen. Um, I don't feel babied, you know, I <laughs> watching the movie, which is unfortunately something I feel a lot of the time watching horror movies. Like it feels like there's actual consequences and stakes and it's, yeah, it's a conf confusing mess, but it, I like the mess. The, me it, the fact that it is a mess is, is part of the charm. Yeah. It, 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 it stays chaotic. And I yeah, guess that's the idea word. with these lead two characters where that, yeah, it's presented in the chaotic way it would be to someone who's just kind of stumbled into this mess and they're trying to get out of it. And yeah, I do agree with the the way these rules, while I guess I guess not founded in any logic, the way it is kind of woven into that chaos does kind of it definitely helps with like the tension and the certain building fears of you as an audience member remembering details like someone says that yeah 
one of the signs of knowing the uh, the the possessed rotten thing is taken over your town is that animals are going to start to go mad or act strange. Mm-hmm. And there are a few scenes that kind of escalate with that, with the goat and the whole shotgun thing. <laughs> yeah. and, Spoiler discussion, everybody, by the way. We are spoiling the yeah, whole movie. Full if you want to watch it, I know it's not like a super popular movie. So if this sounds good, I think it's on Shudder. Shudder produced it, which is a horror streaming service. Yeah. So yeah, watch it. Come back to the podcast or whatever. Watch a horror movie on Christmas. Why not? <laughs> yeah, I would. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I, 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 it, it commits to the bit fully. Like it doesn't hold back. And I was thinking of you as soon as it gets to the the dog yeah. scene. <laughs> it's normally like a, we we joke, but it is kind of an indicator for a lot of these horror movies. Like, are you gonna have the balls to have child characters yeah. actually implicate? Is this them in a some real way? movie like or a, is this hereditary? a baby movie? Is the, really the just <laughs> yeah, that's exactly. the question? And I wasn't even I wasn't even upset at the whole like weird like oh she she seems to be like okay and she doesn't even have any like bite marks but she's like possessed i guess and like all of that after the fact um i wasn't even bothered by you know not seeing like like her fucking head being ripped off or something because what they were showing Mm -hmm. in that moment of violence which lasted quite a lot longer than a moment it was like a minute of her just being fucking dragged around by her neck I was like, this is fucking awesome. <laughs> like this, like, <laughs> and it, and it, I know that these things upset some people, but why would you want to watch a horror movie and not point. be upset by what you're saying? Like, are you, why do you, why do you want to see like a tamed down version? Like, what's the point? <laughs> why are you watching it? Right? Like f- show, yeah, show me brutal shit. supposed to be exploring shit. like fear yeah. and terror and yeah. Well, just paranoia. Go watch the yeah. boss baby. Like, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't want to see a child die in a horror movie. It's a fictional child. Adults' lives are worth more to you. Like, what? <laughs> what are you talking about? Get out of your caveman brain. Like, what is fucking? Yeah, sorry. All right, I'll stop raining. Okay. So there were, mo- there were multiple <laughs> scenes like that where I was kind of like, "Oh, you you haven't cut yet. You're like, you're lingering on this. You're yeah. letting us revel in this this misery. I, I'm liking this. This is brutal. This is intense. And yeah, the the way they build it up, especially like with that tension and real focus on this soundscape of like really uncomfortable sound editing mm-hmm. um, that definitely like helps build to those mic drop moments, like the dog attack or whatever. There's normally some kind of stressful circle of sounds being edited around. Uh, with that kind of chaos that's happening with people screaming at each other and yeah, just these sounds being repeated and it's, yeah, this quite an oppressive movie, like audio and visually. Mm -hmm. I, yeah, Yeah, it's like quite overwhelming. The, the entire filmmaking aspect of this, like the, all of the, the elements coming together to give us the audio and the visuals, even the performances, it's a really well-made movie in all of, those (laughs) senses right Mm -hmm. it's a it's a there's a lot of talent going into creating this film there's some really great shots really great choices for shots and how shots are presented the framing or there's some oneers or you know some overhead drone angles that worked really well in certain contexts yeah lighting is great um the practical effects like the gore um which there's obviously some CG here and there in, you know, placed in some of these effects, but for the most part, it worked really, really well. I think there's like two shots I can think of where I'm like, eh, I don't know if that one worked out the way you wanted it to. Um, I didn't look up the budget, but I heard it's like really low. So I'm going to look that up right now. That's um, where I was, yeah, putting a pin in on that those visual effects because i agree with all the all the practical stuff i love like the old lady being dragged around by the kids and the hammer a brutal moment or uh yeah some of the other like the the boomer the rotten thing uh all the ooze and the pus and the when that's eventually beaten to death how how that was achieved but yeah the like self-mutilation with the axe and just some shots like when they're riding around in the car and whatnot did look a little bit budget to me Mm-hmm. Um, which did pull me out a, cu- a couple of those moments, especially the self mutilation thing with the with the axe, because that's that was that's, funny. That's a fun moment with the goat. Um, yeah, and it's like building up to something. It's like clearly, 
yeah, here's the crescendo. And then and it's like a little bit goofy with how some of the visuals yeah. come together. Yeah, I, I yeah. was, I was still successfully enjoying that because I was shocked and caught off guard in terms of like what was happening. And I do like that it didn't hold back in terms of showing it in its brutality. Um, but this is one of those things where it's like, what is this? This like this director's like second film or something. Let's see. It's not his second film. He's made like a handful. He's made like five or something. Um, okay. But from what I can tell, and I can't really find this information. I wish I could. From what I can tell, he's not working with like a super high budget. That's my understanding. Maybe I could be wrong, but I'll have to find this information somewhere. Somebody leave a comment if you if you know where this uh, the source would be for that or why I would hear that it's super low budget. Anyway... I think for the most part, it works together. And just seeing these tiny little imperfections, I'm still not bothered by it because this isn't a movie that takes itself so super seriously. And it's not a movie that I'm watching in the most literal of senses in terms of like a character's story from point A to point B, right? I believe the performances and I believe what these characters are um experiencing in the context of any given scene but when weird things happen that kind of take me out of the movie i'm still like oh that's kind of silly or dumb but i'm not like being taken out of the movie doesn't feel like such a betrayal of my experience because a lot of my experience watching this is just me thinking about it as a movie i'm not it's 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 in this weird zone of being able to enjoy it completely unironically but also with elements of this kind of ironic enjoyment in it as well. Like if something's goofy, I'm just like still there along with it for the ride being like, hell yeah, this is a goofy fucking movie. Like I'm still just kind of loving what I'm seeing. So it does have kind of a, mm. an armor <laughs> in that sense from me. Uh, certain things might have bothered. Yeah, I can, I can get that. Cause that, that, yeah, it wasn't really like the character's plight or any of like, arcs that they were going through anything like this is really not that kind of movie it's much more about that oppressive atmosphere and mm -hmm. kind of self-inserting yourself into the idea of stumbling into a situation this dire and the the mistakes they make and yeah. just how quickly it crumbles and it's just something i like about the horror genre is it's it's like one of the only places where audiences generally are quite okay with like miserable endings and mm. <laughs> the whole purpose of the story just being yeah there's there's not going to be anything that really <laughs> good comes from this this is going <laughs> to end in a place a lot worse than where it begins and i think that's like a fun thing to explore and i, I do like yeah the way it wraps up and just the idea of this this, this this like parasitic entity this this demonic force overtaking a town and how that looks locked to the these two characters perspectives i thought that's that's cool and cleverly explored with especially considering that kind of smaller budget and the scrappiness that has to come from that um but yeah i think i was just pulled out of the experience a little bit more by some of that those uh lower visual effect kind of shots like when the axe like goes into the guy's head and he becomes a cg monster for a few frames like i don't know if that bothers me more than most but mm -hmm. yeah especially when i'm thinking about oh this is clearly inspired by the witch here or a little bit of hereditary there and there's a never bit, really a in those films where I, yeah where there's just not it's not something that comes into my mind in my absolute favorite horror movies or even like a dead alive type thing uh yeah the tone is just more consistent and something like that more, a bit more self-aware well here's the here's the thing so this director sure he's made a few movies beforehand now we can safely say hopefully ideally that he is at least on the radar of you know people that would be able to give him more of uh, like a budget or more uh, infrastructure to make his next project. Like yeah. maybe his next movie will be like an American production. You never know. Maybe his next movie will just be something that, um, you know, is like produced by neon or a 24 or you never know. I, I, I would like to see the same director tackle something bigger. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. 
I'm I'm kind of forgiving little bits and pieces of this movie just under the impression that it's you know he's still kind of like up and coming and um there's so much there that I'm like there's 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 definitely there's definitely something here there's there, there's so much talent mm-hmm. going into this film that I I have cautious optimism that he could do something really great and I mean this movie is great it, I I think it's great so yeah I think given those caveats it is a very impressive outing mm-hmm. um in this space and yeah there are just so many pitfalls that it manages to avoid and it keeps that intensity for most of the time maybe Maybe I would have liked to see five to ten minutes shaved off a little bit. Um, sure, but it is for the most part pretty pretty concise and just explores its uh, conceit about as far as you'd want to want to see. You know? Yeah, I, I I mean, pacing wise for me, I was not having an issue at all. Um, I did pee at one point, <laughs> like an hour through. I felt like, oh, you know, I could probably pee now. There was like a scene where I felt like I could get away with it. So, um, but uh, otherwise, pace. You know, it's it felt so exciting, and the settings were not stagnant. It was constantly moving from one place to another, and I love that type of energy. Um, that's in a lot of you know apocalyptic zombie movies or anything. It's like, oh no, we got to go here, go here. Like the first thirty minutes of like any zombie movie <laughs> is always days, so yeah. much fun or like yeah. Snyder's Dawn of the Dead or something like I love that type of energy and it felt like this film had that type of energy for a huge chunk of it and even when it when it departed from that type of energy you know Snyder's Dawn of the Dead winds up getting a little like oh, okay now you're just in a mall and blah, blah, blah. like it the 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 energy doesn't stay consistent throughout the entire film same with 28 days later this, I like what it turned into. It wound up turning into more like Silent Hill, Jacob's Ladder, like Session 9 sort mm-hmm. of thing, where, sure, it's not the same energy as, as the beginning of the film, but it, like the what it wound up being replaced with was so suitable for just the second half, I guess. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, loved it. I would I would gladly watch this film again. I want to buy a Blu-ray. I hope there yeah, I'd watch again. exists. Yeah, I did like that whole build up to the uh, the choking on the hair ending and pulling all the stuff out of his mouth and yeah, that that, that was a good way to to wrap up the story. A nice and miserable. Yeah, <laughs> just him screaming at the sky on his knees. Yeah, <laughs> a nice Christmas jaunt. Yay! Very. Very festive, yeah. It's like it's like if session nine was good. <laughs> it's this this delivered on pretty much just a lot. This delivered on so many things that I like about horror movies, and that it, I never see delivered ever. And so I'm just I'm just in a happy, ecstatic place about it, knowing that oh, you can actually have movies that deliver like this. So. Um, we'll see what I think on a second watch. Maybe I'll lower my rating. Maybe I'll keep it the same. Maybe I'll raise it. I don't know if I'll raise it. I think I'm being pretty generous with this already, but I love it. So, uh, for now, eight out of 10, give it an eight. I like it a lot. Yeah. I'm I'm a little bit lower than you. I did. I did enjoy it for what it's worth. I do appreciate that kind of smaller production quality. A lot of it just like shot on location in these little towns and the, yeah, there's like an earnest nature to that uh, that scrappiness, but um, I do think there have been some recent horror films that have actually delivered in ways I wouldn't normally expect, uh, like a Talk to Me or Bo is Afraid or something like this. And I, I don't think it's quite on that level, but a lot of cool ideas. I definitely want to see more from uh, this filmmaker, and I'd probably give this a low seven, three and a half star. Um, yeah, I'd, I'd happily check this out again, but I'm more interested in see what's what's coming, uh, the potential of what is being played with here sweet i'm looking online for like a blu-ray i'm like there's a bunch on ebay from china but i'm like is that real or oh really it, it's, well, it's one it, of those like does what does shadow fund it as well yeah i don't know so it might just disappear and <laughs> it might by the time this goes up it might have just like disappeared off, off the internet 
That's another annoying thing, though, about the the budget's never being available. That's happening more and more. Yeah, more, like streaming funded stuff is. Yeah, why out. don't so the... it never really used to be that much of a secret? No, like, but it is I now. I don't know why they want to just keep these secrets now. They're like, we won't tell you how much it costs, or how much we made off of it, or how many people watched it. Just all these metrics for success that I feel are kind of important to have in a conversation where we talk about movies right <laughs> it's just, it's part of the yeah. conversation but it, the fact it never used to be an issue yeah will seem like something that they felt like they need to hide yeah uh, is it yeah is it just because of the business model being unsustainable and they feel like it's embarrassing i don't it, know i'm just so i'm so confused about it all right, next time you people strike, just to <laughs> ask for that. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's what they're trying to hide is like some of these films come out and they literally get like 5,000 views or something, or like 5,000 engagements and they don't want to have to review all that data for fear of their stock prices I, going down. I, I, yeah, I don't know. I have no idea. No idea. Very weird, but very annoying because it does really... <laughs> It's quite an important point to anchor certain conversations around. Like it would help when we're talking about Crash, for example, you know? Yeah. Whatever. Speaking of Crash. <laughs> yeah, so I guess <laughs> this is my Christmassy recommendations, specifically chosen for its Christmas merits. I guess Crash is the 2004 Paul Haggis and Paul Haggis written and directed Oscar award winning. How many Oscars? Well, six time nominated, <laughs> three time winner. Most controversial Oscar winner of all time. Crash. Um, the story is racism is bad. Is that about wrap it up for you? I mean, um, yeah <laughs> no, what like what how would you actually like if you if you go to like the wikipedia for this movie and go to the plot section it's like just paragraph and paragraph and paragraph and paragraph not because it's particularly complicated but more so that there's like 20 characters and all these different threads and they're all like interlinking with each other and it's it's, it's clearly like a, a a concept there's a concept for this movie and everything with the writing style is like trying to justify this concept more so than actually like explore characters or true juggle complicated ideas it just seems in service for this s spider web like concept of a film um yeah it's uh it uh it, it, it it's it's like a much worse version of like of one of um in Yaritu's films i was just kind of yep. watching this being like damn i wish i was watching Babel. You know, they talk about racism mm -hmm. in that movie. It's not necessarily even like the main theme, but they handled it better. And a lot of these other multiple storyline films that I love, there's usually like three storylines <laughs> and you're able to spend long enough with the characters for it to actually mean something and for you to learn about them and for them to feel like real characters. And so that when they make decisions, you can be like, oh, that's consistent with their character or oh, that's interesting that they did that. Um, and that's, you know, you can see like an arc happening or you can see them grow and you can learn more about them. There's none of that in this movie. It just feels like the characters that that get repeated in terms of like, oh, we see them again. It might as well just be fucking like Friedberg Seltzer. Like, oh, I remember Paris Hilton, <laughs> Paris Hilton is. It might as well be this fucking member berry shit that we see in media all the time now of just like, Oh, a reference to a thing that I saw. I remember seeing that. Like, that's what the characters are in this movie, essentially, is like, oh, you see them once, then you see them again. It's like, I remember that guy. They don't feel like the same fucking person, really. Matt Dillon's character, like, what, are, know, they, what yeah. are they even trying to say by him? Like, oh, and then he redeems himself by saving her in the car. It's like, did you know, did you know that racist, uh, sexual assaulting <laughs> cops are can be good sometimes too they put their lives on the line for the same people even also his dad's got a pee problem and that's probably why he's mad they're like flat caricatures it's like what, are, what are, i don't know what it's trying to fucking say <laughs> it's so yeah. boring well, it's not just that one character with where that issue was coming up for me where it's like every All single <laughs> branch and the, the whole piece as a whole it's like well what are you trying to say it's kind of this weird like centrist like is taking both sides. Each, oh, each yeah. one of these characters is like exploring <laughs> both sides of an argument and then being like, well, 
just putting his hands up. It's like it's like a shrug <laughs> of a movie. Yeah. It's like, well, here it is. But and this this sucks, right? We all know it sucks, but life goes on. It's like this really annoying. Like, <laughs> if you watch this movie, then you're not as guilty as you were before you watched the movie. <laughs> yeah. Well, like, and the difference is with something like a Magnolia, which is like a big epic. Like, I know, right? Paul Thomas Anderson, I like need to watch big, that again. big branching movie. It has Paul Thomas Thomas Anderson direction and especially dialogue. <laughs> uh that that can really help because yeah there's a lot of strands going on in crash and millions of characters and perhaps if the dialogue was quippy or good enough or cleverly written enough maybe you could get by on how little time each one of these characters is given or anything interesting to flesh them out yeah but it just okay. doesn't it's, it's just it stays a mile wide and inch deep like the whole time let's let's follow the complete storyline of just one character. Let's go Sandra Bullock. Oh, okay. Yeah. Right? She... So it starts on her. It starts on her... Complaining about the Asian drivers. Yeah. She has that racist rant. She does a racism. She goes into her SUV, gets carjacked by Ludacris. <laughs> Ludacris. Um, <laughs> <laughs> this, this film was a lot funnier than I was expecting. Goes home... To be honest. <laughs> And is like, okay, we need the locks changed, but we have no idea how to do this. <laughs> so they get mm -hmm. the the their workers, the maid, and like I guess her her relative helping out. Uh, and she's like, I don't trust them because they're Mexican, and says it really loudly, complaining to Bl Brendan Fraser, just in the house where they can hear her. <laughs> and she's like, they're gonna. They're gonna sell the keys to their gangbanger buddies, and it's like in my head, I'm just thinking like, how's that supposed to work? Like, you keep the keys, and like, are you expecting him to take the key? Like, you can you can just not mm -hmm. give him the key. <laughs> what are you talking? About? He changes the lock. You keep the keys. When would he do? When would he copy or sell the keys? He's leaving without the keys. Anyway, <laughs> then he's like, I'm sad. I'll just give you the keys. I wasn't going to do that. I'm a good person. <laughs> and then she's like, well, whatever. I'm still racist. Then later we see her complaining to the maid, like, these dishes should be put away just for just once. Just put away the dishes. <laughs> and I'm like, Jesus, Wait, what are you, you even do? That, do you, you have a that job? Awesome line. You missed that awesome line from Sandra Bullock where she says, uh, He's going to sell our key to one of his homies. Yeah. <laughs> oh, that was awesome. I love that. <laughs> like, I don't know what the fuck she does. His, Brendan Fraser explicitly said out loud, I'm the goddamn district attorney of Los Angeles. So we know exactly what he does. <laughs> and yeah. we don't know what she, like, I don't know if she has a job. She seems really lazy. Like, uh, well, okay. I don't know why you have a maid. But anyway, so her story then concludes by just ignoring her for the last hour and a half of the movie and then come back to her and she falls down the stairs. <laughs> she falls yeah. down the stairs and then says like, you know, you're my, actually my best friend <laughs> to the, to the maid. And I'm like, what? None of this matters. Cause we've seen her for like, she has five <laughs> minutes of screen time, the entire movie. And it pretends that this is significant and this, like, the entire last, like, 30 or 40 minutes of the movie is all of these, what 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 are appearing to be as payoffs, but without any <laughs> real buildup associated with any of them. We got Terrence Howard being like, I've had it with this, and, like, having his, like, freak out with the police officers is like, okay, I understand that one, you know, because his wife got sexually assaulted. I don't know why he's mm -hmm. doing that still. It just seems, like, crazy and irrational, and I don't know why it needs to be from Ludacris or, what, like... The, the ingredients are almost there, but it just doesn't make sense how they presented it. Then we got fucking, oh, I'm actually a family man uh, Mexican guy, <laughs> Michael Pena or whatever. And he's like, actually, I have a daughter. And then the the Persian guy wants to kill him for it, for changing his locks because he got broken into, even though everyone around him has told him, actually, it was your door. <laughs> <laughs> and well, yeah, he, he, he was trying to get Michael Pena <laughs> to he was trying to get Pena to change the door because he couldn't fix the locks because the door needed replacing first and then yeah he got angry at Pena for that 
Yeah, and I guess he was refusing to change it. Broken into. He was like, no, no, you don't need to change the door. He's like, yeah, you do. I can change the locks, but it's not going to fix your issue. No, whatever. And then he's not insured properly because the insurance company is like, this is negligence. And then he shoot, tries to shoot him, but the da- daughter who he had... In the only other scene we saw with Michael Pena and his daughter, he tells her, like, mm, actually, magic is real, and there's an invisible cloak. <laughs> <laughs> so then <laughs> she runs up to him and goes, Daddy, and it's like, I'm... I'm having an a invincible cloak right now. See? And everybody cries and the music swells and everybody's like, do this fucking crazy crying coom face compilation. <laughs> and then they just don't report the crime and the Persian guy goes back to, <laughs> to like life as usual and then it turns well, yeah, out his daughter had blanks and it's like, fucking God, oh God. I hate this movie. This is so stupid. Yeah, the, the whole Christmas miracle angle of it, uh, yeah, just by complete accident, I guess I wound up <laughs> recommending this movie uh, for our Christmas Day discussion. And yeah, that's that's part of it, I guess. So it's just trying to say something about faith and being <laughs> being uh, fruitful and friendly to each other. It's like it's like a really corny <laughs> presentation that that whole anger that that yeah. whole she was my angel. She came to protect me to protect us like thing like with that little girl that was like that was hilarious i thought it building up to this tragedy really <laughs> with, with the little girl being killed was like supposed to be the point of the movie at least, i guess it would probably yeah. be saying more with that than however that plays out it's like what so yeah that well, is when weird. do they explain that it was blanks i don't remember that i thought it was just i think that a, was the implication it wasn't explicitly explained but like the daughter was the one like kind of looking at the ammo or whatever so it's like okay she because she didn't want him to have a gun or something she just wound up giving him blanks and didn't tell him or something i think that was the implication okay like the the persian guy's daughter yeah 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 wow and this almost like uh 28 weeks later where there's this like crazy disconnect with how people talk about this or remember this with how (laughs) watching the film feels there's a bit of that going on but more so like on a critical perspective i'd say some like pretty respected voices like came out to bat for this film around the time it came out mark commode is a big fan of it um roger, roger ebert, ebert yeah. gave it four out of four stars yeah i read that review it as a movie of intense fascination <laughs> yeah it's, it's a very weird it's, review because i basically it's one of those reviews i i read and i'm like yeah invert everything you're saying and then i agree you know, and also, like just ninety percent like, of it was him <laughs> just describing the plot. Ninety percent of his review was just him just saying what happened in the plot. This, yeah, it's such well, a weird, then he gets pervasive, to, like, pervasive problem. I'm like, fuck, this is just what reviews have been forever, and I didn't even notice. Like, that's what yeah. Well, th- this one, this quote from it: "What is wonderful, wonderful about Crash is that it tells not simple-minded parables, but textured human stories based on paradoxes." No. It's just like, I just just really don't agree with that because I found each one of these threads to be completely bare and extremely simple. Like, yeah, you can take any one of these threads and be like, okay, what what actually were they trying to say with that angel uh, Christmas miracle little girl thing? That, That racism is bad and that because he had tattoos and was being judged as if he was a criminal, then then that's bad. So well, okay, well done. <laughs> That's like it's not like a new observation. It's not a yeah. new way to put it on a character or you explore this. It's just like you shouldn't judge people if they look like they're criminals, right? You can't just be like, okay, this guy has tattoos because it's actually people are family people, except Ludacris, <laughs> who actually has a gun and will rob you and steal your car even though he was complaining about being stereotyped. <laughs> yeah. I, that's, and, that and was the, a weird fucking reveal. I'm like, wow, what? Like, is this supposed to be cool? Like, what are you saying? The ludicrous thing was very weird because <laughs> he kind of has like a redemption arc as well because he's he kind, steals kind the van of. or whatever. <laughs> yeah. He runs over the, the Asian guy, but then he oh, yeah. winds up, <laughs> he steals like a van that's like full of child slaves. Yeah. And he like, He's like, I could profit 500 bucks off each of you guys, but you know what? Because I'm such a good guy, I'm going to go let you free in Chinatown with a smile on his face. <laughs> also never acknowledges where his friend went. 
Like he's just <laughs> yeah. he, he is completely <laughs> unaware that his friend is like murdered right now. Dead. Yeah. Yeah. yeah but yeah. it tries to have a happy ending and he's like just does that little smirk at the camera, like, yeah. <laughs> And meanwhile, like, hilarious. like fucking this movie about racism, like the Asians in this movie are kind of unredeemed. <laughs> it's like actually, you were the villain <laughs> the whole time. Was basically <laughs> what it was saying. Like, oh, the yeah, Asians, they didn't get redemption. You, th- you thought that they didn't deserve the racism at the beginning. You thought that they were innocent. No, nope. <laughs> they're human traffickers. I'm like, what the fuck? <laughs> Jesus Christ. That's such a weird reveal. Why is it? Why, it's like, all, can't just sprinkle that in at the end? Everything in this movie is just so confusing in terms of like why you would want that in your movie. Because the premise <laughs> the premise is just racism is bad. Like it's, a, it's on paper, supposedly an anti-racist movie. It feels more racist than anti-racist. <laughs> the, the film as it is feels way more racist than anti-racist. Yeah. Yeah, because it's boiling everyone down into these like really trite observations. No, yeah. no one sounds like a real person. No one feels like a real person. Yeah, and then half the way- of the results is like <laughs> actually these stereotypes are true. <laughs> these are, these yeah. ones are true, actually. <laughs> like that's that's half of the movie. That's what's that's what's so frustrating about like the way the it concludes. It does just feel like it's putting its hands up. Like yeah, racism's here to stay. I guess. Yeah. What are you gonna do about it? <laughs> <laughs> but Christmas. <laughs> What if? But the, we're, we're talking about a film there where the the director himself has been quoted as saying, <laughs> "Was Crash the best film of the year?" Is the question. I don't think so. There were great films that year. It's what he said about his own. That's film. That's fucking hilarious. And the way the way he justifies it though is he says, "So I guess that's what they voted for. Something that really touched them." And I'm very proud of the fact that Crash that seems like Crash it. does touch you. <laughs> People <laughs> still come up to me more than any of my other films and say, that film just changed my life. I've heard that dozens and dozens and dozens of times. <laughs> so it did its job there, I guess. I mean, I knew it was the social experiment that I wanted, so I think it's a really good social experiment. Is it a great film? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> not even, the, not, even so, not the best. He doesn't even know if it's a great movie. He's like... <laughs> Yeah. It's like actually but to yeah. call it a social experiment. Funny. That's so it's funny. Like, yeah. uh, <laughs> ahead of his time. <laughs> it's like a dar man like <laughs> It really it really fucking... is just a dar man video. <laughs> a really long dar man video. <laughs> With like the the moral conclusions are just as fucking weird and confusing. <laughs> yeah, Heavy-handed. They might shit. as well have have fucking gigantic <laughs> subtitles at the bottom. <laughs> Just incorrect subtitles. Yeah, this uh, so fucking confusing and just all star cast. <laughs> everybody, everybody's agent wanted them to be in it. This is just yeah, everyone believed in this. So I wonder when this started production because he might have had a nomination for Million Dollar Baby like right before this, but I don't know how quick the production was on this. They were yeah, they were made very close to each other. Yeah, and, uh, I don't remember Million Dollar Baby being this level. I, I, I remember that liking that movie a out, lot. Yeah, yeah. I think um, perhaps what it's dealing with is a bit more focused. It's not like millions of characters jumping around. It's just focused yeah. on a few. Um, so maybe it's that. But I think just from a from a, a base level, it's just a horrible idea. And like even going to if you go to like the development section. On this movie, there's <laughs> there's a quote from him talking about he later stated that he wrote Crash not simply to criticize racists but to bust liberals for the <laughs> idea that the United States <laughs> had become a post racial society. <laughs> this guy's Canadian which also, like... <laughs> which is fun. <laughs> <laughs> so it's a wow, a, a Canadian dude <laughs> talking about this is set in los angeles criticizing yeah. american racial structures in los angeles <laughs> yeah while <laughs> making awesome. like the v- f- most fucking racist stereotypes imaginable in your film <laughs> like he really does seem like kind of like outsider <laughs> trying to trying to give his two cents here and i, I guess everybody just kind of fucking ate it up it really does feel like you know this winning best picture was just Everybody simultaneously saying like, "Yeah, we're sorry. <laughs> we deserve this. <laughs> like, we're we're acknowledging our transgressions. 
Uh, well, there are theories that, of course, this was Brokeback Mountain year, um, and actually Capote year as well. Yes, uh, both both losing out to this with the the more Brokeback Mountain being the controversial best picture mm-hmm. loser to this. Um, that's kind of the big drama here, and so like, yeah, everyone, including the director of the film, agrees basically. Um, just just shocking, and I guess. What is the theory that because Capote and Brokeback both have like gay characters and a gay emphasis that Crash is just safer, less controversial, less it's just an easy well, you, Oscar win, Oscar pick, isn't it? It's 2004. You want to end racism but keep homophobia going a little, <laughs> right? Yeah, <laughs> you're, yeah, you're fine with what, that yeah, for a bit gay longer. Marriage right? wasn't legal. You want to just make sure. Yeah. You want to make sure we hang on to homophobia for a bit longer. <laughs> <laughs> That'd be an inter- imagine yeah, just- crash, but it's about homophobia. <laughs> 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 Everyone's gay, or <laughs> or not. It's like it's 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 trying to do everything. It's it's trying to do what five seasons of The Wire do. <laughs> under two hours <laughs> you know it's, yeah that is funny it's trying to like break down every socio-political concept race relations affirmative action sexual violence <laughs> police yeah. brutality gang violence it reform does, it's like oh my god what are you what are you trying to say with this it doesn't spend enough time on anything to in order for anything to no. mean anything or be significant like what the fuck was brendan fraser's story what did he do? <laughs> like, what was? The, did he have an he didn't arc? Have one. He, uh, he was pretty much was only there because I think he he was one of the main reasons the film got made. Him agreeing to be in it because that's how much of a pull Brendan nice. had around this time. Um, because yeah, what six million dollar budget, pretty low. I'm mm-hmm. pretty sure the director had to remortgage his house like three times in order to get this made, and it yeah. was a huge, huge success as far as what it brought into the box office. Nearly nearly a hundred million off that. That six million budget, which is absolutely nuts. I guess audiences love, love this. Um, yeah, premiered at TIFF. <laughs> yeah, I wonder, like, if if I would have been swept into it, being a if I was there at that premiere with everyone losing it, a bit of a more <laughs> simplistic understanding of some of these things. Yeah, well, so what, did did you watch it when you were younger or no? I had a hilarious memory actually mm-hmm. to do with this where I was only like 10 when this came out, but I'm pretty sure I went into like the living room my mum was watching it and it was the like little girl angel mm-hmm. scene and I remember thinking it was dumb <laughs> as a 10-year-old and I just never thought about it again. That's great. I had this weird deja vu when watching it but outside of that no nah, i've not seen it yeah so i like whenever i rated it on my imdb account for the first time so who knows i could have been like 15 or some shit like I, this, is, this is an ancient imdb yeah. account um i gave it like a five out of ten and i remember i do vividly remember feeling th- what the intended emotions at certain snippets of the movie like i do feel like uh, and and even on this rewatch, um, maybe it might just be like memory emotion or or like me remembering mm. how I was feeling at the time. But there's certain there's cer- there's certain things that do click with me in this film, not in the greater context of the movie, but completely removed from the rest of it. So like the the scene where she's like in the car and like it's fucking lighting on fire and like just that moment of like the fl- you can see the flames behind her you can see her start like freaking out and him being pulled back like mm-hmm. there's something that feels kind of like desperate in that moment and and i think that the the performance and the visuals and to some extent the music although now retrospectively i really don't like the music at all but um <laughs> it is the least bad in that scene <laughs> and there's there's things about it where it's yeah. just like the the pieces of the production fit together in a way that in that moment I was like, okay, this works for me. Um, but you know, now watching it, I'm like, fuck, like why, what are you trying to say here? And the whole, you know, (laughs) not just what are you trying to say, but like none of this makes any sense in terms of like, you would just cut the fucking seatbelt immediately. No, no officer or, you know, firefighter, anybody arriving on, onto a scene like this is going to have a little pep talk with her, for like five minutes 
<laughs> while they, while yeah, she's like trying yeah. to get out, you're, like you just fucking do it, get out of there. Like, and no, nobody would do that. That is un- entirely unrealistic, realistic, and stupid. Yeah, and and just as is most of the drama in this movie. Yeah, <laughs> and, and like you could have made like individual short films almost out of a lot of these. Like, there's no glue holding these stories together other than just like oh they walked past each other here (laughs) like at the end Mm -hmm. like the the woman that we saw earlier she gets involved in a car crash is like oh dude it's her it's it's literally just (laughs) it feels like reference reward (laughs) like there's nothing there's no significant purpose towards them being connected it's just they are connected incidentally and they're everybody's racist and crashing. <laughs> everybody's mm-hmm. racist and crashing. <laughs> Everyone is racist. That's that's the strongest through line. Honestly, that's like the strongest thing that it's saying. It's the biggest message that it has to say. Yeah. Everyone's a little bit racist. Everyone. I say, like, okay, not nice. And but that, half of the time, your assumptions about people are right. <laughs> and they're doing secret human trafficking yeah. and they will fucking mug you and shit. But it's going back to the Academy Awards it won or was nominated for, right? Yes. Some of the, some of the things it was nominated for or won are just like shocking. Yes. But the, the biggest confusing one to me is it, it won for best writing, best original screenplay. It actually won that. That's um, crazy. <laughs> and um, and please re- remind me if there are any no moments of editing that stood out to you. Yes, that, that it won best achievement in film editing. It's crazy, actually. Um, I can explain that one. Like why? Cynically. Why? It's because it's multiple yeah, stories, please. and they're like, oh, they, they did such a good job <laughs> making them all go together. That's probably why it won writing too. It's like I don't know. I don't know if people just forgot about the concept of like multiple stories taking place at one. Like this is it didn't invent this at all, but it just seemed like no, oh wow, may, you can have a movie that's popular about racism that does this. I, I don't know what the fuck. It would blew people's minds apparently, but that's my explanation for the film editing is just like no, they edited all of them together as if it's not just like oh, this is already in the script that it's I don't know because <laughs> there's some atrocious editing in this movie. The, the 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 scene where they're um uh comparing rap lyrics to uh like country like lynching songs or whatever and yeah. it keeps cutting back and the, the cuts are so fucking quick that it's incomprehensible mm-hmm. but it's just two people in a car talking to each other and they keep cutting back to this one shot of him uh like ludicrous's friend like i guess like being all up in his face with like a smile and it's this weird like he's looking directly at the camera and it cuts so quick yeah that scene is awful it's it's like a genuinely terribly edited scene (laughs) um and so yeah i what what was it up against like what the what was going on let's see editing it was up against yeah just other normal movies cinderella man constant gardener munich walk the line um no, no idea no idea absolutely confusing and another thing that i well i guess before i move on to that i'll mention there's some terrible audio editing and i guess that's technically a different category for the oscars um but there are two points in the film where i very explicitly heard them reusing the same take multiple times one one time it was just three times in a row um when the persian guy i noticed that at least once oh yeah Yeah. it's crazy it's crazy it's so blatant the persian guy and the uh mexican guy and the lock being changed or whatever the persian guy's daughter uh comes she says the word dad three times in a row and it's the exact same take they just kept repeating the same take (laughs) dad 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 i was like what the you're really doing that and they did that (laughs) they they did that multiple times in the movie like with different takes they like they just did that (laughs) <laughs> and it's so noticeable and they're right next to each other um oh man yeah not great not not great uh putting the film together not great editing not great uh the things that i love about movies are not in this movie <laughs> all of the performances that were that are present in this film all 800 different performances uh matt Dillon was picked out and got nominated for best performance by an actor in a supporting role. Mm-hmm. I guess 
I guess he kind of has the most screen time, prob- probably. Of who? Yeah. Who? Um, did anybody the get nominated <laughs> for like the lead? Are they all considered supporting? That's a good question. Like they didn't yeah, want to. They I didn't want to like <laughs> go through the effort of figuring out who the main character was. <laughs> yeah, that is a good observation. I can't even. No. Yeah. yeah there's no nominations for lead. There's no. <laughs> Which makes no sense because they who who the fuck even knows who the lead is in this movie? <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely doesn't have one. But I guess if you had to pick one, it would be him. Just find and, out who yeah, has the most screen already... time. I think that's literally how they calculated his screen time for lead performance and supporting. Oh my god! But that would be a tough one. <laughs> tough one to try and find out. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I he did a good job. I, I my criticisms aren't really with Matt Dillon, I guess. His character was annoying, but the standout worst straight up acting was probably Sandra Bullock for me, as far as like she sucks. There's just no <laughs> there's no scene where I'm like buying that this is this character. All I see is just Sandra Bullock. There's a lot of bad performances. Paycheck. Ludacris sucked. Brendan kind of fucking sucked. Like his everything Brendan Fraser was saying sounded so fucking fake. Like if he was doing a fake voice the whole time. <laughs> like, he was, like he's a little kid trying to sound like an adult. <laughs> it, it seemed like they had him for a few hours and like they were rushing Honestly, through his stuff. That's, that's the vibe I was getting. They filmed that. his scenes in like, like an hour. <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> and the same with like Keith David. That was something I did like. I was like, oh, this character is kind of oh, yeah. cool. He's I got a gravitas. He I, like, I like Keith David a lot. But it's like one scene with the whole joke again being... Yep, look, uh, black people can kind of be racist too and endorse these systems as long as they're right. okay. It's like, God, God damn it, man. This is so lame, this repetitive point. They just keep hammering again and I'm, again. And I'm going to take that cop character too. Yeah. yeah. Ugh. Fucking Don Cheeto, <laughs> his character <laughs> and his resolution at the end. I felt like they... like. There was no nothing that made sense leading up to that being what his character was. So essentially, he he turns out to be the brother of Ludacris's friend who gets shot by the fucking partner of Matt Dillon cop. And so yeah. at the hospital or whatever, uh, John Cheeto's mother is like, you can't pretend to be a part of this family. You were always so busy and you're just blah, 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 blah. And I guess like maybe the point of that was trying to just show like, oh, you know, like some black people, they have really respectable jobs and some of them turn to a life of crime. They can be from the same family and it really just mm-hmm. depends on what you're blah, 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 blah. But I'm like, it felt weird because it it, it felt like earlier they were setting up Terrence Howard's character to to be what would more appropriately be that because they had an entire argument over like, uh, you know, like you're not even that black, uh, to each other, the, the couple, uh, like you haven't mm-hmm. experienced real racism because your skin is actually lighter than most black people. And he was talking about how, you know, the, the, uh, association with him being like a famous movie producer. And like, they had the conversation about, uh, him and the director were saying like, oh no, like he needs to talk more black. And it's like, okay, mm-hmm. that would make, if Terrence Howard's character wound up being the brother of that guy, that would make way more sense than Don Cheeto because there's n- not fucking nothing happened with Don Cheeto the entire movie other than him. Like he had sex with a woman and said that she was white, even though she wasn't over the phone for some reason. Like, why? I don't know why you did that. <laughs> and, yeah, why like, what so else happened threats? with his character? Why does it need so many? What else happened with his yeah, character? You get pay- nothing. Nothing. You could have removed it. You could have <laughs> removed his character and just had Terrence Howard experience that instead, maybe. Right? But then you can kind of, you can do that with pretty much any of these short stories. Like, the, the thing that always intrigued me about this movie was seeing that poster with Michael Pena, like, ah! screaming. <laughs> and the little girl. But the when I actually got to that scene, I was like cackling with laughter because that of was the, the funniest. It scene. It's like <laughs> it's so corny and goofy the way it comes together, and yeah, nonsense. The, the whole like, yeah, the whole miracle angle and all of that. It's just like I can't, 
we're really going there? <laughs> this is like Unearned. Hallmark corny. It's like, <laughs> yeah, it's so goofy and corny. It's like, I, yeah, I cannot, I cannot break down any any of what it's trying to say. It's so, it's so, it's so surface level. It's so. It, we often talk about these as normally as to to praise a film this type of writing where there are lots of different characters and they all feel like different characters where this is an example of the inverse where every character just feels like the same writer the writer yeah same the same perspective mr haggis yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they always feel like paul haggis's like observations poorly packaged with like uh, we got to go back to ludicrous for a minute cause like what yeah why, why was he like trying yeah. to get into Hollywood <laughs> at this time? Or whatever, like I guess he's, he's in all those Fast and Furious movies, but there's no, there's not like an angle in those movies of like, yeah, this is the Oscar winning or Oscar <laughs> no Oscar piece, uh, trying to big up Ludicrous project. I don't know if that's what he was going for in 2004, but it's a really like funny, weird character, like to have him freeing the child slaves and stuff and do yeah doing their little smirk it's like tonally very weird and <laughs> clearly not thought through this it's, like it's uh, <laughs> yeah it's like this, this movie <laughs> feels like very... a parody of what you would like it feels like bait to the point of <laughs> did i ever tell you about <laughs> yeah, there's there's the, this is more prominent in the oscar <laughs> shorts category cuz i'm not sure they even watch them um mm. but there's there's a movie like every like few years there'll be like just some obvious bait that get like just cynically wins the oscar anyway there was one a, a short <laughs> called skin where it was just like it's the funniest thing ever if you've never seen skin the short <laughs> no, please why it's the funniest fucking thing it's like probably funnier than crash um but it, it, you know every <laughs> once in a while you see oh yeah you gotta see it um i'll see if i can find it on youtube or something um uh, every once in a while there's something like that where you know I'm just watching the Oscars. I'm like, they're going to pick that one. They, 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 they didn't watch it probably. And they're just going to pick it because it's like, Oh, racism bad or whatever. And it's just the ob most <laughs> obvious insincere bait ever. This is, this is a film where if this didn't exist and someone made this as a parody, I would say that's unrealistic. That's too far. <laughs> this is a film that like, if, if this didn't exist, I would be like, no, that's pushing it. Like, I don't, I don't, Th this seems like even too much of bait for the Oscars. This seems like this seems so insincere and bad that there's no way this would be a best pi picture winner. And yet here we are. <laughs> it really just feels like a, an unbelievable parody. Like you could make, yeah, I would love to see now, an actual parody of this movie. I, I was cringing at the, um, <laughs> in the, there's like a Mark Kermode, uh, like, audio review of him talking about this film and he ends it by saying yep i just saw it again and i just really feel like time is going to be very good to this movie. <laughs> uh, and then smash cuts it's 20 years later and me bum, watching bum, this bum, bum, <laughs> and i'm just like oh i i i was more entertained than i thought i was going to be i thought this was just going to be kind of boring bad but i thought this was so inept in what it was trying to do that it was actually quite funny very funny. Just how insane, how melodramatic, how corny, how like over the top, <laughs> stupid, and like there's this there's this like kind of earnest nugget at the very beginning of it that's like it's it's tr it's trying to do something but just failing so mm -hmm. spectacularly with such finesse or lack thereof. Mm -hmm. It's like yeah, there is something spectacular about, and then of course ironically funny with how how much has been like jerked off and supported it's it's very weird it's like the <laughs> i don't know is it the film that kind of revealed that oscar veneer a little bit like what the f well this what? okay i mean <laughs> yeah there's this 2004 i'm assuming every single academy voter was like a 90 year old white guy anyway <laughs> <laughs> and it was just like you know, we're, we got to tell everybody how bad we feel. <laughs> this is this is our public apology to the world for being racist and also being <laughs> like pedophiles and Harvey Weinstein and shit. Um, so we're just going to we're just going to we have an out and we're going to make people think that we're good people or something. I don't know. I mean, like I'm saying that and sure, like there's people that obviously connected with it. But like, even when you read the Roger Ebert review, he's like, I think people will be better people from seeing this. <laughs> 
it's it's so embarrassing this movie and what it brings out of people uh, yeah this is a this is a hilarious retrospective as in just being able to to look at this 20 years later and be like damn <laughs> yeah this honestly i can't believe i'm saying this but it makes me want to apologize to green book in comparison it's worse <laughs> that's that's like well written compared to this you know? Yeah, Green Book is like a disappointing win. Like, ah, oh, come on, whatever. This is like a formulated, but this is like an actual fucking train wreck. It, like, it is a crash in of itself. <laughs> yeah, you can't look away. Yeah, it's the obvious joke, but it's true. It's very true. Like it, 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 it <laughs> like there's not a single element that holds it up. Like it's not like we haven't really talked much about like the framing or the way it was shot. But it's, it's terribly shot. It's so it's so frantic and up close, especially like so many close ups on faces, and you never really get get a good feeling of the space you're in. And it's no. supposed to be it's supposed to, I guess, have like a attention to it. A that frantic nature is supposed to make it intense and be like a, a character drama, like this is England or something. This is breaking down the the walls of society and getting in up close. But so no, I just can't tell what's going on, and I'm just I don't need to be seeing everyone's paws all the time. This is <laughs> just claustrophobic <laughs> and distracting and lame. Oh, and the songs we got to talk about the, the music. music the that music was is terrible. It, it, it was so funny. The little girl fake out death scene and, like that song that play- everyone everyone like loves this song apparently like obsessed with the, the crash soundtrack the wonder woman like- soundtrack <laughs> yeah it does kind of sound like that <laughs> it just it was not appropriate it- <laughs> but the- <laughs> all of the all of the serious subject matter like now i now when i look at the poster i like yeah, i it- smile and like start giggling which is <laughs> which is not <laughs> Looks like he's singing the theme of the movie. Oh, like, true. I can't, yeah, I can't take this project seriously anymore. No, <laughs> like, not 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 knowing what it was and just like there's such a a memey quality to this. It was vague <laughs> enough. Like before I rewatched it, like looking at that poster, I was like, oh, that's a good poster. And now I'm like, oh, cool. <laughs> <Goal. laughs> yeah, I feel like that's such a failure. <laughs> if like <laughs> anything that reminds Aye. you of it, like makes you smile and laugh <laughs> at it. <laughs> it's not like a reminder of like oh that remember that great scene or oh that color palette's all coming back to mm-hmm. me now looking at that poster it's like nope <laughs> it's, it's every bad thing is coming rushing back even ignoring oh the wonder woman-esque qualities to many of the songs in the soundtrack even the parts without like the weird vocals it it was just so fucking droney and sleepy <laughs> and it, it it has this weird like almost there's there's a certain quality to the way that this soundtrack sounds that is just so fucking stuck in the mid 2000s. I have only ever mm-hmm. heard things that sound like that within like a 5 year period in the mid 2000s and then never again cuz I guess everybody decided it sucked. Like th- th- <laughs> this movie, the soundtrack especially makes it feel so fucking dated. Whereas, you know, Brokeback Mountain yeah. same year incredible soundtrack doesn't feel dated in the slightest in fact brokeback mountain feels ahead of its time <laughs> mm. Bro- brokeback mountain feels like like a more modern movie even though it's a period piece whereas crash feels mm. just like so st- perpetually eternally stuck in this <laughs> stupid <laughs> yeah. 2004 time period of just some shitty oh, yeah. like it's made for tv the- quality fucking canadian film basically <laughs> It sucks. Yeah, and it's it's like, man, it's not like this was an attempt in the '60s or something. No, you know? it's, <laughs> it's 2004. We had Lane, American Beauty, fucking <laughs> do the right thing. We've had like loads of films that like talk about these kinds of things already. Everybody forgot. <laughs> it's just that response, like it. it, it I, I cannot exaggerate enough to the audience like how funny it is to sit down and watch this film in 2023. It's crazy. Like you could say it's like painting my expectations <laughs> too harshly or wrong, but it's like actu- it's actually mad. Like it's got like a 7.7, pretty high rating on IMDb. Like four, nearly half a million people, half a million ratings, and a pretty solid meta score. Then you sit down and watch this like actual parody 
you you could watch it like an American Psycho, like and just pretend mm-hmm. <laughs> like it's written to intentionally be a parody, and it it kind of works on that level, like a really a really good comedy, an awesome unintentional comedy, but yeah. just mad that like so many big names were attached, and yeah, just the groundswell support it got. I really In every avenue, yeah. critically money, like it's just mad. I really do believe that like this would be a perfect film to parody. <laughs> Like why not? <laughs> just just make a movie like this, and then just the the implied significance over random dumb shit that's way over dramatic and insincere. Like that that that's comedy enough. It seems like you'd, you'd be able to <laughs> mimic that to like a pretty good degree. Like I I would love to see a parody of Crash. Seems I've, fucking awesome, right? I don't even know how you do it because it's already sort of a parody of itself. I know, right? <laughs> like, do you remember that, that final <laughs> shot? That final shot where it's like wrapping up the final one of these spider web stories. And then it just like shows the LA skyline for just a little bit. Like, well, the adventure's done here, guys, isn't it? Let's, let's just cornerly wrap this up. Oh, LA, you're just so nutty crazy and a little bit racist <laughs> whatever yeah we're all it's racist like, but <laughs> we're here yeah like what? it's it's so empty it's like saying nothing for two hours it really says nothing for two hours i like the second half of this movie was very funny the first half of this was like the most boring fucking shit in the world i was like <laughs> having watched this and um when evil lurks like in quick succession i watched this one mm-hmm. beforehand but that was my frame of reference i was like Damn, like 40 minutes has passed in When Evil Lurks, and that felt that like at about the same amount of time had passed watching Crash for five minutes. <laughs> Literally watching Crash, I think I just said out loud, I was like, the, the last five minutes have felt like a fucking hour. <laughs> I'm constantly looking back it's at the It's because that structure never pays off in any way. Or no. Changes you don't know what you're following. Anything, or Nothing builds. Anything. Yeah. You're just, it's like fucking yeah. changing the channel every fucking five minutes. It's like, it's, TikTok, like people, it's like a TikTok movie. It's like, move on to the next, like, what, are you going to come back to that and build on it in any meaningful way? No. The expectation though is that they're, they're almost doing, that they're doing something like a memento or whatever. The way it's talked about makes it sound like that it was doing something with structure. Rashomon. Like that, that important or whatever. Um, Pulp Fiction. But no. Well, yeah, yeah, because this, I guess this was from, yeah, just a few years removed from these kind of revolutionary uh, non-linear narratives. And maybe they, yeah, maybe it was all just whipped up in the hype of that <laughs> groundswell of those types of films. Um, but this one does not age like those, that's for sure. No. There's nothing really to learn from this movie except, I don't know, an, an easiest Oscar win ever, right? Yeah, <laughs> it, it, it pisses me. It would be less of a piss off for the best picture win if you we looked at the other nominations and we were like yeah you know it wasn't a very strong year broke back is the only one you need to look at <laughs> that yeah. movie has aged fucking incredibly and is a really great mm-hmm. film and we talked about it on the podcast um yeah, yeah. easy answer awesome episode a fucking layup you don't even have to think about it no done Right, that so that that, that them, makes though, it annoying. Who is going to be going to bat for this film over that? It's cr- it's actually crazy. Mark Kermode. Um Let's ask him about it. <laughs> yeah, clearly. <laughs> <laughs> but like, when you look at him justifying what what like inspired him to tell the story and whatnot, right? Writer and director Paul Haggis was inspired <laughs> to make the film after being carjacked by two African American men at a blockbuster video on Wilshire Boulevard <laughs> whilst driving home from the premiere of The Silence of the Lambs in February 1991. Afterwards, he began thinking more about the impact of race, ethnicity, and class in American society. <laughs> so like, oh. Cool. He got woke. <laughs> he didn't really do the best, the best job of like exploring that. No, not at all. I, I, I wonder if he just like fantasized in his head like, man, these people that robbed me, they were probably having some very meaningful discussions right beforehand. <laughs> yeah, they were probably just, going on a, a fucking few hours, monologue. I'm sure. What, <laughs> oh yeah, oh the monologues. That's that's most of what it is. It's these like, ludicrous monologues, these self-important characters. Like yeah, just monologuing and, and and speaking in ways that no human would ever speak to another human. Never. No. <laughs> just they all super feel fake truncated as fuck. and 
awkward. Yeah. <laughs> Ludacris is terrible at it. And that's his entire character. Every time he's on screen, it's like, let me just monologue for another five minutes here, ultimately leading to nothing, but just being like, I'm going to stereotype other people, but I think it's unfair when it happens to me. Okay, cool. Next scene. I'm going to stereotype other people, but I think it's unfair when it happens to me. Okay, next scene. Exact same shit. You don't say anything new. Why are you Why are you including more screen time of him saying the same fucking thing over and over? <laughs> Build on it. Build on it. Show me something new. You have, like, you have time to explore things. Why are you just repeating yourself? It's so fucking... Oh, it's a, it's an exhausting experience. It's a truly exhausting movie. <laughs> no, but everyone's a hypocrite, man. No, let me just tell you that again. Everyone's a hypocrite, man. Yeah. It's just that, like, on repeat. <laughs> and if you watch this movie, and then you're a better person. <laughs> <laughs> if you acknowledge it's like it. In the 2008 Empire poll, it was 460 in the 500 greatest films of all time. What? In 2010... Ind- the Independent Film and Television Alliance selected Crash as one of the 30 most significant independent films of the last 30 years. <laughs> so it's can like, we take that poll again? Like, does everybody feel that way still? <laughs> can, we, can, we, can we get like a Mark Kermode rewatch? Does he have a Patreon where we can suggest like a, a <laughs> yeah. movie? Like, <laughs> so it seems like there's no disagreement even with anyone. So everyone, everyone kind of knows what Crash is now. But it's like it's, it's like doesn't it doesn't deserve it's it's, it's you know the history is written by the victors thing it just feels like what this is so wrong there's something so deeply wrong about this movie <laughs> getting the accolades it does because I, I could live with it otherwise it'd be just a funny drama but it is just where it sits because of that and yeah I guess it'll always live in infamy it. Uh... Yeah, it uh, it's terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. It aged like shit. Broke back. <laughs> broke back. Should have won. Stop the count. Stop the vote. Yeah, fuck it. What, what else do we say? And somebody mentioned on the subreddit um, that he like got me too kind of, or l- let's just say he is a civilly liable racist, but not criminally liable. So he paid. Uh, money to someone. Who do you mean, Paul Haggis? Yeah, Paul Haggis, the director. But, oh. but, um, he, there are prominent anti Scientologists, as in people who left Scientology, like Leah Remini, uh, who have speculated that this is just part of him leaving Scientology and that it might not be a real thing, even though he was found civilly liable but not criminally liable so just wanted to mention that uh yeah i'm aware that that exists but i have no fucking idea where the truth is on that or what to even say about it just i'm aware that it's a thing that uh happens so paul haggis is is a scientologist as well he used to be and he was he was when the release of this movie happened and then left the church and as has been documented, the Church of Scientology like goes after people that leave the church. That might be irrelevant. Mm-hmm. It might be like that that has nothing to do with uh, the rape allegations. It might have something to do with it. We don't know. I don't know. I wasn't there. I have absolutely no clue. But that's the that's the consensus is that it could be or it could not be. I don't know. Oh, yeah. There are a few articles from November 2022 about this. Mm-hmm. I'd suggest reading those for more info. That sucks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I really want to watch Magnolia again, but I'm holding out for a 4K release or something that hopefully will happen, right? Get on it, Warner Brothers. Who owns this shit? Yeah, imagine. Did you get the Crash 4K? <laughs> oh, no, I didn't. <laughs> <laughs> no, I downloaded it. <laughs> I'm, sure, I'm sure there's a Crash 4K, right? I don't know. Well, uh, two out of ten for that one. It's uh, terrible. <laughs> it's terrible. Yeah, yeah. I was I was pleasantly surprised by how it kind of lived up to its expectation of infamy, how, like, sappy and badly written and saccharine and just kind of I don't know. It's it's condescending. <laughs> it it seems like it. It's something you'd put on when you're teaching like 
12 year olds about racism you know i don't know if i would <laughs> i don't know I, I, I don't know. even then they would come away with the wrong conclusion <laughs> yeah i think yeah. they would start like being so more little. racist if they watched that movie yeah yeah i think you're right there's there's really no good reason to ever screen this movie no <laughs> come to think of it it's, um, it doesn't even so serve many its better purpose examples yeah there's not a single great shot i remember or line of dialogue or life lesson scene of drama life lesson <laughs> yeah especially with what you're saying it is all about that right well i suppose there are a couple of scenes i remember thinking yeah the blocking of that was fine there's some kind of interesting camera work but it's in service of this like just atrocious monologue dialogue that does feel preachy that does feel like you're acting like you're saying something but when you sit down to actually think about these conclusions like wait oh you're really just saying a whole lot of nothing with this yeah big big fat uh one out of ten yeah damn or one out of five yeah <laughs> yeah i thought this was this was hilariously bad yeah nothing mattered and it, it <laughs> reeked of pretentious self-importance and insistence um yeah that it just did not live up to in any meaningful way terrible writing terrible music terrible directing fucking a lot of bad acting yeah pretty much on every level it's a uh, absolute disaster it's jesus christ best picture Best picture. Best picture winner. Best Four writing. stars, Roger Ebert. Four stars. That almost annoys... The writing one specifically almost annoys me more just on, like, principle. It's like, come on, why? Hmm. I suppose you could do that with all editing. So it's like, all of these wins are just so confusing. So, like, how, oh. could, how could you watch these movies and come away with that? Is that <laughs> I, I What's really funny, I just noticed another terrible editing thing they did a bunch of times in the movie that also makes it feel incredibly dated to 2004 they did that thing where they're mm. like we're gonna slow down the footage even though we didn't film it in a high frame rate so what you're left with is yep. just this like one frame per second <laughs> like oh dramatic yeah, music yeah. over Looks top like, like i don't know what the fuck was going on where apparently some people thought that that worked for like 10 years or some shit like from the 90s to 2000s or something damn but like even at the time, like even at the time, you kind of looked bad, right? It's kind of yeah, cheesy. Yeah, that always looks garbage. Yeah, it always looks cheesy. That's terrible and editing, and it won. Ugh. That's bad. You could make a compilation of like the bad editing in this movie. <laughs> it's a Bohemian Rhapsody. Well, bad bad lines, bad performances. Yeah, it, I was thinking about Bohemian Rhapsody, but this is pro this is worse than Bohemian Rhapsody. I'd say probably significantly. Worse. As a movie, yeah. You don't have like <laughs> one central character or like a Rami Malik equivalent performance. It's got, yeah, it's not focused enough for that to even contain something of that quality. And I don't even like that movie. Yeah. That would have been a bad best picture win if that won. <laughs> <laughs> that would have been a bad one. Ready for some questions? Yes. Yes, I am. Nice. Let's do some questions then from the Sardonicast community. Head over to the suggestion thread on the subreddit to leave questions for future episodes, just like Mushroom Party 50 do did, who said, if your movie sucks, does that mean you hate yourself? Yes. Right? Yep. Um, but the real <laughs> one is this one from Matt Smith Ray. <laughs> Adam, you recently mentioned how your own boredom affected your rating for Oppenheimer. I myself have found myself getting bored in some of what are considered the greatest films of all time. And you admit that something like Jean Dillman can be a boring experience despite appreciating it. How do you think people's own personal boredom should affect their appre appreciation and rating of a film? I would never make a prescription of should for someone else. It's really up for you to decide, but... Uh, Jean Dillman, like the, you know, the boredom is kind of the point of the film and it's like, it's okay, intent, what, what is yeah. the intent of the film? Right. Whereas like, um, the boredom in Oppenheimer, I don't believe, <laughs> like, I don't know if, if we can say that that was the point. And again, that's entirely subjective. My second watch of Jean Dillman, I was not bored throughout the entire thing, knowing mm. what I was getting into the second time. Um, and kind of observing it in uh i guess what i would consider to be like the more intended way to watch the film um being able mm. to experience it for the se second time and knowing what it is i was not bored uh so i wound up loving that movie a lot more despite being bored on the first watch um yeah i, I would say it's up to you to decide how much that weighs into your review but i mean at the end of the day like 
boredom is just essentially another way of saying that you're not connecting with what's happening on screen. Um, you don't get bored by <laughs> by movies that you're connecting with. Um, no. Maybe parts of movies that, you know, you're just not connecting with that one part. But um, yeah, I, I mean, that, that does influence my rating. And I can still rate something positively, even if I didn't f- fully connect with it. Or I could still, you know, rate something lower, even if I do connect with it. There's a lot of different factors going in. And it's, uh, you know, part personal thing and part... Uh, technical part director's intent part you know lots of stuff yeah i feel like specifically the intent is a a big deal there with the boredom factor where that's definitely not in my opinion what oppenheimer was going for at all i think it's for you failed on that mark and that's why it was a criticism for you uh yeah and i might i might be less bored on a second watch with that one too right I feel like I, I, even ignoring the specific nature of Jean Dillman, there's plenty of movies where um, on a second viewing, I'll be like, okay, now that I kind of know how this is structured, I'm less bored because I don't have like false expectations about where it's supposed to go narratively or pacing wise or something. Yeah. Um, or it might be some slow cinema thing. Or, yeah. 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 We always say it. The second watch is often the first watch really that's that's why that's why for certain slow cinema like um nuri bilge jaylan films um Mm. that's that's why for things like those if i'm introducing people to his uh work i'm gonna give him a big warning like hey this is gonna be beautiful but it's like really slow so you have to prepare yourself mentally for a slow movie i feel like that helps yeah I feel like knowing the length of something, if it's a long movie, like the worst experience you could have would be thinking you're going into a movie that's 90 minutes and it turns out to be four hours because then you're just thinking like, wait, are they not wrapping (laughs) it up? Like what's going on the whole time? So I do feel like that information does help depending on the type of film. Definitely. Knowing what you're getting into. Um, I'm curious what you think on this one from Dovazar. Folks on Twitter recently lamented the lack of buzz around animated series Scavenger's Reign. Some went as far as to say that adult animation will never break free of the stereotypical, unfunny, cheaply animated sitcoms, Big Mouth, Chicago Party Aunt, etc. Because adult audiences will never shake the assumption that animation is for kids unless it is over overtly vulgar and looks like Family Guy. What do you think it would take for mainstream audiences to accept animation as an equal art form? to prestige tv also thoughts on scavengers reign have you even heard of this um it's only something i've recently discovered it's a you can't say hbo max any was it? it's just max now it's, so max. Oh, it's on max yeah it's like a max original i guess so it'll probably disappear in a few months as well yeah um, tax right off <laughs> and three people it's, ca- it. it's called tax yeah. right off <laughs> it's the new name of the scavengers tax yeah, yeah. Just tax um, tax uh, I yeah, have not it's got heard like of it. Seven thousand ratings on IMDb. And despite it's me cool. not having heard of it, it is on my watch list. <laughs> so at some point, somebody sent me a link, and I clicked the watch list. I've button. seen, yeah, I've seen a lot of clips from it, and some of these shots from it being shared, and I, I think that it looks really cool mm-hmm. uh, visually. I, I, I can't speak on the writing, but as far as art direction and it being, it's like a more adult setting. There's there's blood, there's violence. Yeah. Um, and it's kind of what we're always talking about as far as adult animation. And here's an example look- of it, and there it is. No one wants to see it. I'll well, it. It, here, here's the thing. It looks cool. I don't know if I don't know if I agree with the premise that you know people decided not to watch it because of those uh, stigma against adult animation. That could you you could be explaining why it wasn't marketed properly because i think that's the real issue is that nobody's heard of it and nobody's talking about it yeah right nobody's talking about it because it's not being properly marketed so if you want to if you want to explain that away as like oh fucking david zaslav or whoever's making the decisions at max in order to promote it and you know maybe even on their own platform it would help if it was just on the front page because we have other examples of animation for adults that exist that are pretty successful 
Uh, Netflix's uh, Love, Death, and Robots is an example. A lot of its computer animations. I think some of its 2D animation as well. It's anthology well, um, kind of, but it's a, it's adult c- animation. Cyberpunk. Yeah, Cyberpunk. Cyberpunk Runners, but the difference is Netflix. that Netflix promotes the shit out of those things. When they release it, it's on the front page, and you can see that it's a thing that exists. I don't think that Max is <laughs> promoting it as much if less people know about it. They need to work on their marketing. I think that's probably the biggest issue. Um, and the more of these things that exist, the more we can fight that stigma. That stigma doesn't really seem to exist in places like Japan. Um, no. So, yeah. Be the change you want to see and uh, pimp it out. And maybe they'll, if they do a season two of something, then they'll have more faith in it and actually advertise it. But right now, yeah, I think it's just a marketing issue first and foremost. Yeah, I'll probably check out a couple episodes of this because I do think it does look exactly like the kind of thing I want to see in this space. But it is, yeah, disappointing that they probably don't know how to advertise it or to- or what space it's supposed to fill. Yeah. Um, unfortunately. You know, I'm sure there is a hunger for it, but it's not it's not an anime it's not like based on Resident Evil or something yeah. people know, some IP that people already believe in. So it's it's got a couple challenges that it's trying to overcome. Um but yeah, it's I don't know, it's just an ongoing problem. It's like these these streamers, these streaming companies, the the green lighting like hundreds if not thousands of projects a year <laughs> and what percentage of those like rise to the top it must be less than one percent they forget they're about looking for those squid games <laughs> the, yeah it's the model is based all around right like, the the, other, yeah. those those five successful ones if that and they will hopefully <laughs> bring in enough subscriptions to justify the other stuff that they can write off yeah yeah it's just yeah there's something very sad about that because um, there, there are gonna be a lot of victims when we look back at this whole space and this uh, experiment with this model but we'll see where it goes yeah speaking of seeing where it goes affectionate duck 882 has this to say apologies in advance for leaving a huge downer of a question for which film positions slash departments do you think will be the first to be replaced at least predominantly by AI and which will be the last other than that Keep up the great work, gents. Happy to see y'all on my Spotify wrapped three years in a row. What are the most expensive things, like visual effects and things like this, they'll want to target, right? It's yeah, like, I think they're starting with, the like, money. background animation. Yeah, right? like concept art, stuff like that. Uh, yeah, true. Probably stuff like storyboarding. And, yeah, if you can just, like, type prompts into, yeah, I want this guy in the foreground. This is a, here's, here's a rough sketch. Flash this out into a full... Like, I'm sure that will be stuff that's immediate. I mean, that's already happening now Mm -hmm. as far as, like, concept art being generated using AI. and So that's, I feel like, where it will start. And then you just got to go to, like, where do most of the movie budgets go into? Where are they going to want to cut corners the most? And it will be probably creative positions like, yeah, visual effects. Um, what, What can we automate from that? Like, particle effects and automated lighting stuff and, you know, Hmm, yeah, these big projects are going to want to target. I'm curious about music and score because a lot of these, a lot of films that come out mm. <laughs> right now feels like they might as well be auto generated. They already so, sound it. Yeah. 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 <laughs> right. When <laughs> you're saying like, that, oh, about writers, though, too. the two characters are with each other, and, they, and then it's just like, oh, you do the high piano sound when the tear comes out. It's like, things are already so fucking formulated already that it's like, I, I support real artists that are actually trying to say things, not saying that people shouldn't have jobs if they're making bad art, I guess. But like, I don't know what the solution is here. I don't know what the I don't know if there is a solution other than to try and warm people up to the idea of like universal basic income because our jobs don't actually exist for any reason other than for us to have money right now. And that would be nice if we moved away from that thought process, right? Mm-hmm. Well, like, uh, stuck in that way just of thinking. Like a week ago, I watched that film, uh, The Creator, that new Gareth Edwards movie. Mm-hmm. But the whole crux of it is supposed to be this kind of AI issue and these AI people and robots and whatnot. And I was reading the soundtrack to the film was originally supposed to be like AI music 
Um, and they they got Why it not? working, and they were like happy <laughs> with where it is, and they were like, yeah, it looks thematic, right? But they scrapped it at a certain point and got Hans Zimmer in to oh. do the score. And, <laughs> and as you were just saying, like <laughs> it might as well have been an AI generated Zimmer score. That's there's funny. Like, yeah. Nothing about it. That's great. Um, that <laughs> made it stand out. But yeah, I think it will be. St- I mean, it, it's unpredictable. The the like sectors it's been targeting first like i don't think anyone really anticipated it to infiltrate the artistic creative stuff like first (laughs) that's like where it's going first is the audio the visual the like you open adobe premiere and it's like we're working on ways we can just edit your videos for you isn't that yeah that's interesting (laughs) i mean like here's the thing if if whatever ai editing takes place is something that you can still like manually change and uh adjust i think it would be cool if you could train an ai on your own editing style because right now i think what exists is like oh if you want your video to be like the most most formulated tiktok whatever then you can just content farm your way into making soulless content it would be interesting if if like you could train an AI on your own editing style in the sense that like, oh, you actually want your style to exist, but you just, you know, there is a formula to it and we don't need, you know, to fucking destroy your wrists doing it. That'd be interesting. Yeah. But then it kind of gets into the the quibble quop conundrum. Right? <laughs> it's like, <laughs> like, is it good to automate parts of your work so you can make more of it or is the making it the actual expression i wanted to have this Uh, conversation with you for a while i don't know what like your whole (laughs) what your whole perspective is on quevelcott but he's like so obviously rage baiting he's just like he's you know he's fallen off in terms of relevancy he makes like fucking minecraft content or whatever his views going down yeah i know but like his views going down and now he's just like oh but it's ai (laughs) and here's the thing People have such a, um, like an uninformed and just kind of knee jerk reaction to what AI even is that he's able Mm -hmm. to pretend as if his videos are AI when, sure, there's AI generated elements to the video, to the videos, but it's not completely AI generated. Obviously, someone is playing the game and then he's just using AI software to take an existing playthrough that he's either paying someone else to do or that he's doing himself and then just overlaying just to get clicks. And then the AI is, is mimicking that with the face visual and then also mimicking his voice. So I, I, what I believe he's doing is just like, Oh, he's gotten someone else to just, or maybe even himself (laughs) to just do the one pass through of the, the game doing a regular playthrough, you know, doing a Mm -hmm. regular edit and then just adding AI elements to it. It's not like it's not like the AI is playing the game and like placing blocks and no, like no, reacting no. to things. I don't know. It's kind of weird and funny. Uh, we are so far behind where AI could realistically do the things that Quebel Cop is claiming to be doing. <laughs> that people are just kind of getting worked up o- over nothing for no reason, and he just wants attention, and we're all just giving it to him is essentially what's happening. <laughs> so you had that whole, it was like that Twitter uh, publicity stunt, I guess you yeah. could call it. I'm done. Like trying to trick people. <laughs> but now it's the <laughs> yeah. model 2.0, actually. You're stupid. <laughs> when, yeah, it was pretty, I don't know, it was pretty obvious through the video that it was like a creepy AI version of Quebble. But mm-hmm. yeah, I don't know. It's like, what, is he trying to fundraise or just farm engagement anger? It's it's his, literally uh, just about getting attention. <laughs> but it's like so pathetic. Yeah. So so needless. Like, I mean, has he really got nothing else he could do with his time, with his resources? It, it seems like is his he, main like, goal is to get attention, and it has been for a while. <laughs> I guess, yeah, I just can't understand... I guess some people are just fine being branded like a bad guy as long as they're getting eyes, right? Some people, the attention is the end goal and nothing else matters. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, I can see it through that lens. It's just like, why? Like, 
Even people who consider themselves Quebble fans, like, are turned off by it. People are... Que <laughs> there's Quebble fans? <laughs> it's crazy. <laughs> it sounds crazy, but there are. If you, like, go on the, the AI videos and they're like, man, you changed Quebble, man. You used to you used to play GTA real good. Yeah, can't even. Yeah, do that it's anymore, probably man. some people that watched them when they were like six years old that haven't even touched his content for the last ten years, are now just commenting back on it, being like, "I this is not what I remember." <laughs> even though Quebble was kind of uh, Sniper Wolf uh, 1.0 in some ways. Oh yeah, yeah, it would do like the exact same thing she's doing now and getting all the heat for oh. just like watch like yeah do like react video videos on like uh different animated stuff like superhero fight animations and all this stupid it seems stuff. like he's like constantly changing what the fuck his channel is supposed to be and just trying to continue throwing shit at the wall and hoping something sticks and this AI thing is just something that stuck for a bit because people rage clicked on it. <laughs> and he got more yeah, attention. So it's like, that I'll keep going category, with this. that category of YouTuber where in the mid 2010s, they got into either the GTA or the Minecraft algorithm yeah. and made like millions of dollars. Um, I was like, yeah, why can't you just be happy with that? Why you got to do all this stuff now? Uh -huh. Yeah, this, it's just cringy. So yeah, it's embarrassing. It is, it is cringy. But what are you going to do? I'm, I'm just, I, I am, I'm super interested in the whole AI thing and we'll see where it goes. Like that just over the course of us talking about it on the podcast, it's transformed so much. And this has only been like a year yeah. or two, right? Yeah. And it was like a joke at first. And now it's like people are actually a little bit scared. And mm -hmm. like dissertations are being written with it. They can do five <laughs> fingers on each hand now. <laughs> yeah yeah i'm not, yeah i'm just not sold yet if it's gonna if it's gonna solve or change anything to do with maybe writing of a certain level like it might improve like maybe hollywood writing on like blockbusters like it might genuinely make it better with some of it maybe <laughs> um but i don't know how you could have it fill these kind of more uh, creative roles quite yeah. yet. Uh, Everything that I enjoy about movies and every artist that I pay attention to and follow, it's not going to affect them first. <laughs> They're going to be safe for a while. They're, we're no, not, we're the not making way, AI like, Charlie Kaufman movies for a while. If we did, we did like, get a Harmony Korean AI, <laughs> but that's about it. Oh God. <laughs> if, if you're saying like you could plug in there's like an algorithm that could scan your entire YouTube channel and go through every single video and figure out a way you cut, a way you edit, a way you present your stuff and mimic it quite well. What's to stop that same algorithm doing that with like a, a David Lynch, just go through his entire filmography and break down his style and then sure. generate new Lynch. I would love to see an AI generated David Lynch movie. <laughs> I think that would be interesting. <laughs> <laughs> like what is I, I'm I'm super interested in what the imperfections are in this technology and what uh, the 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 machine learning I don't know if the word thinks is appropriate but what what it thinks something is supposed to look like so I I'll subscribe to some of these subreddits like Mid Journey or whatever um, and I'll just see yeah. what other people are creating I don't really create a lot myself in terms of AI prompts. I find it confusing and just not worth my time. But a lot of other people are mm -hmm. just creating things and they'll, they'll be like, okay, this is, I want, they'll get 12 different images for the prompt being something like, uh, make a funny meme, but the caption is sad. And so I'm kind of just, I'm fascinated watching over time, these AI machine learning things eventually start to create real words and sentences. And I find it super, because right. before it was like, okay, none of these are real letters and they're not in any particular order and ma or making any sense. Now we're starting to see some. And like one of the, one of the images was like a newspaper clip or something. And the title of the newspaper had s said something about a man like s swimming in beans. And then the image also had like, <laughs> beans in it i'm like okay there's some consistency there mm. i find that interesting um and and also yeah the the 
the fucking up nature of it, the randomness, the the imperfections being visible, I find that interesting too. I find it funny. I like the idea of noticing uh, what is wrong <laughs> in like an image or a series of images. Um, I find it super interesting. I think this is like six months old at this point. Um, have you ever seen the AI generated like Will Smith eating spaghetti video? Yes. Yeah, like I find <laughs> that super interesting. Yeah, it's terrifying, but thinking about like how a machine interprets the concept of like us eating and doesn't get the through line consistency of like, oh yeah, something needs to be in someone's hand and then go into their mouth and disappear. But it's still figuring things out and just like what its interpretation of it is, is just so obviously wrong for us, but it's interesting. It's interesting in which ways it's obviously wrong for us. It's interesting thinking about what certain aspects that it needs improvement on for a while it was you know the number of fingers on each hand um and seeing it evolve over time i like i I like it i think it's cool um will there be terrible things that happen because of it maybe probably i don't know but i'm just kind of here along for the ride observing and uh you know you can't fucking do anything about it (laughs) it's like open source at this point you can't stop it (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, it can't be stopped. It, it, it's too integrated into, especially money now. Yeah. Like, it's it's already, like, infiltrated the stock market. Like, it's made all these companies accrue all this extra wealth. And there's, like, this race for the best AI now. And it's like, oh, my God. <laughs> yeah. Wait, that that just happened <laughs> just in, like, a weekend. Yeah, every, pretty much. Every, like, big major tech company has their own AI division now. Fucking all, Twitter just released like one. A, yeah. And apparently, like, And it's the, woke. The, <laughs> of course. <laughs> no, apparently like the a lot of the time AI right now is it's not actually solving things, it's just referencing the correct answer. And the next major step will be when it's no longer has the need to reference things, but it actually understands the answers to things and can solve problem solve basically. That's like the <laughs> the next scary jump. Um I don't know. It's interesting. We'll see. This is it's definitely very interesting. And it's especially where it intersects with art and the idea of when when you have something one to one that can trick most people, like the Turing test basically basically, but with AI art. Um so we're not quite there yet because there's there's normally like a that's that's AI generated. Depends on the image. Patina. There's some that look really, it's getting really better. real. It's and it depends less and on less. the person you are. It depends on how much of this content you're familiar with. I consume enough of it because it's just in my subreddit yeah. or whatever. I consume enough of it where I'm like, okay, now I see some things where I'm like, that reminds me of the, what you know, if you want to use the word style that I've seen a lot of AI art generated in. But then, because obviously I'm a furry and I see a lot of art that other people actually create um Mm. you know there'll be a point in time where i'm like that looks ai generated but then i but then i'm like okay but but it's not and and this is just their style so i am kind of being tricked by it already Mm. there there's things that there's things that i have like incorrectly attributed in both directions and it's not frequent i feel like i'm pretty good at identifying these things but it already exists in that at that point, <laughs> yeah, the <laughs> we're already are there. Becoming more, more hidden, yeah. yeah, and it is, which is really cool. Yeah, that is crazy, and I don't. Know, I, I think it just makes people feel uneasy, you know, at the the true state of our our place <laughs> in the universe, like the fact. That you I can mean, design something that can, yeah, bring out this unspoken. Um, just binding agent of like creativity that isn't supposed to be like a binary. We like to think of it as something that isn't binary and it's like there's something more interpretable and vague and spiritual maybe. Yeah, but, I think yeah. I think people are um existentially terrified of anything that kind of reveals that we are not like magic. <laughs> and uh-huh. that and that word For sure. flawed and that word, you know, depending on your perspective like really simple you know we're we're just fucking Mm -hmm. 
chemical action reaction centers just responding to stimuli and giving uh, responses based entirely on our uh, biological uh, chemistry our like our brains are physical things that exist they're not magic right the chemical reactions happening in your brain the conversation we're having right now it's all it's all just action reaction in the same like pe- people people make arguments about the whole concept of ai being like no they're just like taking what somebody else did and then feeding it back that's what human beings do that's what human beings do it's doing it in a different way mm-hmm. it's doing it in like a way that is very imperfect right now and maybe um you know we're tracing it in in a we're we're tracing it down to something that we can consider to be like less legitimate or like you know th- there's an entire moral conversation we should be having about it and I'm glad it's taking place but it, at the end of the day we're all we're all just feeding we're we're all just being fed information and regurgitating it in some way you know as long as you're not mm-hmm. like actually plagiarizing then great um make it yourself as in make it something that is true to you. Um, but I mean, as, as we were saying, like the, the fucking music and crash is not, it's not like, like that, that's, that's something made by a human being, but it's also just a regurgitation of everything else. You know, I didn't even watch the, the creator or whatever. Like you're saying Hans Zimmer's score sounds like it might as well have been AI generated. Like I think most people creating art, are just kind of <laughs> making bullshit and not something interesting and just kind of doing what other people have already done anyway. I think that's most art. Um, I obviously gravitate to things <laughs> that do more than that. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't know where to go with this. Anyway. <laughs> yeah, there's, yeah, these things are never normally made in a vacuum. Like it's if, if a human who's never been a part of any culture who's just been yeah. placed in a empty white room with no influence yeah they're not even going to know where to begin they're not exactly have have anything to build off and that is like a human thing and sure it can be like a criticism um when it's too overt like that's something i brought up with like the joker or whatever where it's like it seems overtly um kind of referential or building off the bones of something that i prefer and that's a problem for me um mm-hmm. and that's distracting for oh me. yeah but then at the same time i'll the turn Scorsese around movies. And, yeah exactly whereas i might turn around and watch i don't know the original star wars and forgive it for just being the hidden fortress or whatever you know like mm-hmm. i'm sure with every film you can you can pinpoint like this inspiration comes from comes from here or this book or yeah. this philosophy or whatever um yeah it's yeah, just about, it's like, just does it justify about, it being its own thing, or are you just rehashing something that already, it, you know, we any new piece of art the it should serve a purpose by existing and not just being like, oh, you just made this again, <laughs> or you be just combined this and this but worse, yeah. you know? Uh huh. Yeah, Crash is just worse Magnolia. <laughs> <laughs> Well, more this one specifically for you that I was curious about from cool. Fat Gods. Adam has talked before about bad anthro character designs in movies. Space Jam 2 comes to mind. But I can't think of any anthro designs he specifically praised from a furry perspective aside from The Lion King. What other films have well-designed anthro characters and what makes them well-designed? Um. Well, I mean, a lot of basically any... The, any character that winds up getting uh, popular with furries is like a well-designed <laughs> uh, anthro character. <laughs> you have the characters from Zootopia. Uh, you have the characters, the redesign of Puss in Boots and like death, you know, like they're, there's, yeah. there's something yeah, yeah. to them where it's not just an uncanny valley of like disgusting, ugly nonsense. Um, there's some things that just that just don't work. Like, I don't know if you've seen Don Bluth's Pebble and the Penguin, but those no. penguin it, they have beaks and they have teeth underneath their beaks, and it looks terrifying. And Ooh. so, in, on certain frames, you see like the full teeth under their beaks, and I'm like, Jesus Christ, it just does not work. Um, so, 
you know, there, there's no hard rules for anything. Like there's instances or that where you can make something work. Um, but, uh, yeah, at the end of the day, character, character design, depending on what purpose you're grading it as you can ask questions like, is it a memorable character? Is it a distinct character design? Um, does their, uh, facial expression or like size or body language or presence, um, does, does it communicate something about their character and the way that they're designed? Um, you know, but when I usually when I say like bad character design from a furry perspective, I just mean like they're ugly as fuck, um, which, <laughs> you know, most movies that have furry characters in it, you can't imagine that that's the goal. Um, you can't, right. you know. So does that mean does that mean you've you've mentioned to me before that Madagascar is one of those furry unfuckable Korean movies? They are unfuckable does that characters. Mean... <laughs> But if they if it's a Except fairy creator movie, then how does it does that not mean they're well designed characters if it's doing that, if it's working? If it's working in what way for who? Uh like if it if it creates fairies, right? Or it's like it, one of the things that can awaken that part of some people's it? minds. <laughs> I thought that's I'm just kind of what you told me, man. <laughs> what I told you. I thought you. it was one of those yeah, I thought it was like one of those Lion King type movies where it's like... No. Yeah. I don't remember telling you that. <laughs> oh. Maybe maybe, maybe uh, Cat BF said something like that. I remember he liked... Yeah, Madagascar. okay. Um, <laughs> but I... Yeah, no fucking way that, that... This was not one of my furry awakening movies, that's for sure. Madagascar is... <laughs> I think I was like already too far gone by that point anyway. Um, okay, yeah. But I just remember you having a... Yeah, specifically a problem with those characters yeah they're blocky yeah, they're, they're like legos they're, yeah they're, <laughs> they're pretty repulsive looking but yeah and the way they move and everything too like there's so much to a character in terms of like design and animation you know could could, could be like body language and like the movement like andreas deja you know, Scar is obviously my go-to example, but like, look at look at the fucking mm -hmm. body language of that character. It says so much. Like, there's a, there's a there's a livable, breathable character that exists there in that sense. Like, it's something that was created out of fiction, but exists in such a consistent and believable way. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's so, there's something yeah, to like that. attach onto in that sense. Um, yeah, it's a combination of just a lot of what human beings, furries included, um, appreciate about like character design in terms of like connecting with characters also has to do with how well you capture the human nature of the performance and their design. Um, mm -hmm. Because otherwise you're just doing fucking John Favreau's Lion King, where there is no human character. You you just have lions that happen to be making human type <laughs> sounds with their mouths, um, and they're not emoting in any way at any point. Um, but if you capture the yeah. human, you know, the human nature of of these performances, you know, eyebrows are like a big thing for uh, anthro animal animation and. You know, what is their mouth doing? How do they react? You know, like uh, tons, tons that goes into these intricacies. And the most talented animators are hyper aware of all of the details that you could possibly include about a performance and a design. So I'm not going to pretend to be an expert because I haven't studied personally. I have not studied the 12 principles of animation. So I guess my point here, my points here are all invalid. I can't say anything. So, um, <laughs> Yeah, otherwise, uh, interesting. Yeah, a lot going yeah, into interesting it. Perspective. No, no one answer, but there's many, mm -hmm. many working parts that are not necessarily uh, blanket uh, solutions for every yeah. problem. Hmm. All right, we did it. Nice, we did it. Uh, I'm going to recommend a Christmas movie anyway, so. Oh, do it. Dang it, yo. Uh, it's a Christmas miracle. It's a Christmas miracle. I'm recommending a movie on Christmas that is a Christmas movie. Um, I've never seen it. Black Christmas 1974. Um, nice. It's apparently Canadian. 
Uh, it's apparently, nice. allegedly, maybe I'm making shit up, but I was told that it was like considered to be like the first slasher movie. So like, I guess, nice. or maybe like popularized. I don't know. It, it seems to be, it seems to have a very important uh, place in the genre in terms of its history. That'll be interesting. Um, hopefully I enjoy it. Hopefully I find it good. I'm also going to watch the two remakes, <laughs> which are supposed mm. to be horrendous. Not so And <laughs> yeah, so th- 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 this will be fun, I think. So if you want to watch the two remakes, go for it, because that's what I'm going to do. But they're all... An unexpected trilogy. Okay. Yeah, they're all 90 minutes. They're not like the longest movies. And, you know, we got a couple weeks before the next recording. Awesome. So. Get ready for a Black Christmas. So yeah, if you, if you haven't seen Black Christmas times three, watch them <laughs> before the next movie come or so the next episode comes out these podcast episodes come out every two weeks you can listen to them early by going to sardonicast.com signing up for premium it's only two dollars a month you can download the episodes you feel good about yourself you can also go to patreon.com slash sardonicast that's patreon.com slash sardonicast i kind of flubbed the way i said it um you'll get the episodes early there too if you like patreon you can do that um we also got merch link in the description. I I've, I've been talking a bunch about uh, you know memeing about getting sardonic ass merch for your grandma. Somebody actually fucking oh did it. Oh my god, it happened! It's I saw this post and I was blown away and I was. It's like great. They a took a Christmas picture cry. with their grandma wearing sardonic ass merch. I've got it. Both by, wearing it. <laughs> both Bofa by Dab Sloth Seven Ten. And it's a perfect, perfect, lovely picture. You can see that she is the happiest that she possibly could be from the wonderful energy emanating from the Sardonicast hoodie that she's wearing. Now, that's the real Christmas miracle right there. It, it, it really is. It is the most epic Christmas that could have happened. <laughs> and if you want your Christmas to be epic, which it's, I guess, already Christmas today... <laughs> when you're listening when it's public literally today if you want it to be the most epic just you can look your grandma dead in the eyes and be like yo i'm gonna order us matching sardonic cast hoodies and you show her the receipt <laughs> you say i'm sorry it's not here today i'm sorry it's not here today but you see that it's in shipping it's gonna be shipped at some point and she'll go thank you <laughs> grandson or granddaughter or grand they them Thank you so much. Mm. I liked it. <laughs> that was beautiful. <laughs> Christmas time is here. <laughs> All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Have a um, happy, unspecified uh, religious dominant denomination day. Christmas uh, have win- a day. winter time. Um, have a day of some sort and a happy Shrek. Uh, thanks for listening. Bye-bye. Bye bye. Bye.